Well, as the days grow dark toward the end of the age, we need to be reminded constantly that we're not going to be here forever. Amen? If you're not glad about it, well, you get about it. Don't forget to be reading Battling the Host of Hell. We've asked everybody to try to go through that first book again. And some are reporting they're discovering a lot of things in there they'd forgotten all about or never did touch base with before. So, let's hurry and finish through Battling, then we'll start on Conquering. That's the one that's full of testimonies. See how many testimonies, see how many people are left here. How many people are here who have testimonies in the books? One of the books, I say, yeah, there's still a few of them survived around here. All right, praise the Lord. Let's do this one. <clears throat> now there's a promised land made for all the same. by without saying I love you Lord Jesus but I don't think so let's do it let's sing that one the one that came from Indonesia I love you
once more and let's let all the cares of the day slide away. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's open our Bibles, please, to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. <clears throat> Look down to verse 46. You know, the disciples were very ordinary people. They were not super people at all. They were just ordinary people. Ordinary human beings who met an extraordinary Savior. And they had their faults and failures, and they had a lot of rough spots to work out, just like you and I do. And in Luke chapter 9, verse 46, there arose a reasoning among them which one of them should be the greatest. Does that sound familiar? Who's the most spiritual? Who has the greatest authority? Who is the smartest? And Jesus, Jesus, perceiving the thought of their heart, took a child and set him by him. Now, I don't even know whether they were arguing about this necessarily. In another place, they were arguing about it out loud. But he said he perceived their thinking. He knew they were sizing each other up. Saying, well, I've got him beat. I mean, I'm better off than he is. Let me see. Well, I don't know that one. I have to watch him. He's coming along pretty well. I'll have to... You know, they were getting a striving spirit. And, and Jesus perceived the thought of their heart, and so he took a little fellow and set him by him, set him probably upon his knee, and he said to them, Whosoever shall receive this child in my name receiveth me, and whosoever shall receive me receiveth him that sent me. For he that is least among you all, the same shall be great. Now he's telling them, isn't he? If you want to be great, what do you do? You take the least position. <clears throat> Did he get through to them? Not hardly. Here comes John. He said, well, since we're discussing who's going to be the greatest, <laughs> and uh, you know, how do you have to be great? Uh, Master, uh, we saw one over there casting out devils in thy name. And we forbade him because he followed not with us. We put a stop to that. We told him to stop that. He wasn't with us. He wouldn't. He didn't belong to our bunch. So he just cut that out. Now notice what he was doing. He was casting out demons in Jesus' name. And he said, "We forbade him because he didn't. Fight. He's not in our bunch. He didn't. He didn't join our church. And so we forbade him." He's standing there smiling, you know, he's going to just say, well, praise the Lord. That's good, John. You put a stop to heresy right there. Yeah. That's what he expected. That's not what he got. Notice what Jesus answered. He said, forbid him not, for he that is not against us is for us. And another rendering of this, I believe it says, Jesus said, nobody can work a miracle in my name except God be with him. Did you know that casting out demons is a miracle ministry? When we first got into this, you know, we were throwing out demons by the hatfuls, and by the basketful, and then by the truckloads. I mean, it seemed like the more we learned how to throw them out, the more hauled up and dumped at our door to be thrown out. And uh, we were just having a good time. And, you know, you'd see all these signs and advertisements about Miracle campaign, miracle crusade, you know, and all these uh, so and so was coming to evangelize or to have supernatural wonders and signs and all this kind of stuff. You know, I thought, boy, that must be nice to have a miracle ministry, you know, because we just cast, we get people saved, cast out demons over our place mostly. And uh, then I ran across that that no man can do a miracle in my name. And he was speaking specifically of casting out demons. We have a miracle ministry. But you know, we've been doing it for months and didn't even know it. Of course, that kept us from getting puffed up about it because by the time we found out about it, well, then it was kind of old hat. And we thought, oh, oh, yeah. Well, isn't that nice? Praise the Lord. 
And uh, some of these folks that are always wanting a miracle ministry, well, we could introduce them, tell them how to do it easy, you know. They wouldn't have to wait and wait on the Lord for the anointing to flow. Or wait for some supercharged teacher to come through. They can just do what Jesus said and cast out demons. They'd be working miracles. Isn't it funny that people won't do it that way? They won't do it the other way. It came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up. This is Jesus. He set his face steadfastly to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And the Samaritans didn't receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, James and John, you know, they're the sons of Zebedee, their brothers. They also had the nickname, the Sons of Thunder. And I pointed out to you several times, I thought we'd better tie it down to the scripture so you didn't think I just made it up. Uh, they were the sons of thunder, and with good reason. Those boys were uh, pretty tough ca characters when, before they met Jesus. And we think about John, you know, the one who wrote the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and Revelation, and that's true, he did. But by the time we get a hold of him in the Gospels and so forth, the Lord's worked over, worked a great deal in his life. He was a th son of thunder when he came. He could thunder almost as well as Peter could. And James wasn't far behind him. But here, the sons of thunder still got some thunder in them. And they were insulted. These Samaritans had the temerity to say they didn't want to have any meat and thank you. Just don't pack your, pitch your tent here. We don't want you. And so James and uh, John decided they'd fix it up. And they came to Jesus and they said, Lord... Wilt thou that we command fire to come down out of heaven and consume them, even as Elijah did? If you've got a good Bible example, it's all right to do it, isn't it? Said, is it all right for us just to have fire come down and consume them like Elijah did? And uh, I don't remember the fire consuming people when Elijah called the fire down, did it? Not on the mountain, it didn't. It consumed the sacrifice. It's easy to get your scriptures twisted, though, when you want to do something, isn't it? And uh, he turned and rebuked them. Now here's zeal without knowledge. Boy, if there's a bunch of that running around loose today. Zeal with twisted scriptures. There's a barrel full of that running loose too. He turned and rebuked them and said, You know not what manner of spirit you are of. <laughs> they had some kind of a spirit in them. A religious spirit, a religious evil spirit that wanted to do good, do bad things in Jesus' name and call it good. Now that tribe hadn't died off. And he didn't say you're unbelievers. He just said you have an evil spirit in you. You don't even know what kind of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. He said, don't worry about them. Pass them by. You don't have to whip everybody you meet. Have you learned that yet? You know, sometimes you don't have to convince everybody you meet. Every once in a while I run across somebody who writes me a letter. And boy, they write me a, they'll write me a ten-page letter. Now, Wynn Worley, I'll tell you one thing. I don't believe what you're saying. I don't believe in what you're doing. Well, I hate to disillusion them, but I could care less whether they believe in it, whether they uh, like it or not. But, Lord, they didn't tell me to do it, and it doesn't really affect me a great deal. I don't even know them from Adam's off ox. For all I know, they may be Satan's best spokesman. And I'm certain I'm going to be upset about it. But I, you read on, and they say, and I want you to answer me this question. I want you to write me this verse. I want you to analyze this verse. And, uh, why it would take me two weeks of Bible study to scratch out answers for things to write to them if I cared enough to answer their stupid questions. And most of them they could look up themselves and the rest of them they could solve if they wanted to. And I know by experience you don't convince them anyway because they just come up with uh, another 11 pages. 
You say, what do you do with them? I, don't, I just throw the things in the garbage. Oh, I let everybody read it first because it's kind of fun. See what the idiots are saying out there. I mean, I don't know how they have such so much time. I had a long, I went over into Ohio and had a meeting and the pastor of a church over there wrote me a long letter and he just demanded that I answer certain questions and if I could answer them then he would be glad to join the deliverance movement and I thought we don't want you who asked you to join in I don't want you on our team you have a bad bad spirit but he went on and on castigating just about everything and he knew absolutely nothing about demons or about deliverance and I mean the questions reveal how ignorant he was and he demanded that I answer him. Well, first, I wasn't going to answer him at all. Then I got to thinking, well, he'll go around and say, he was afraid to answer. Well, he shouldn't have, I shouldn't have had that thought. So I dipped my typewriter in acid. And then I began to write. And I wrote and told him that in the first place, I wasn't going to bother to address his questions because they were all in the scriptures. If he wanted to know, he could find out. I had no obligation to answer his questions at all. If he really wanted to know, there were ways to find out. I had written seven books on the subject. If he was interested in knowing what I thought, it was all written out. It's on tapes scattered all over the country. And my viewpoints are there. And if you like them, okay. If you don't like them, they're still there. And I had no intention of writing him a book trying to convince him because it wasn't, I'd had no interest in convincing him. And before it was through, I put the riches on him. I told him that as far as Christians having a demon, he had some very dreadful demons, and he should seek the Lord about it, find out what they were, because they were keeping him from understanding and thereby keeping his people from being blessed. He didn't answer, but I hadn't heard any more out of him. Then I put a note on the bottom to send this to our mailing list in Ohio. We didn't, but he didn't know that. <laughs> it was just a lovely thought, you know, to let everybody around him know what a kingpin he was. But Jesus just said, pass them by. When I first got into this, the Lord said, freely you have received, freely give. You'll go through the doors that I open. If the door's closed, don't worry about it. Then it's closed that I didn't want you to go through anyway. He said, the ones that I want you to go through, nobody can close. So that's why a lot of times you hear me announce I'm going someplace, and then all of a sudden you hear it's been canceled. And you say, well, gee, doesn't that make you discouraged? No, not really. Because God said I would go through the doors he opened, and if he doesn't keep the doors open, I sure won't get in there and have the devil close it on me. You know, I'm pretty good size getting jammed in the door. And uh, so I'll just, get, I'll just go in and out the doors that God opens, and let people understand or not understand. A lot of times people don't understand. They say, well, I don't know why Pastor Eddie's always traipsing around. Well, it's none of your business, first place. You didn't call me. But in case you're interested, the Lord told me to do it, and that's what I'm doing. If you hated traveling half as much as I would, you wouldn't go anywhere. But I travel simply because that's what God told me to do. And as long as God can use me to raise up workers, to encourage the workers that are already there, and yeah, that's what he's doing. And I certainly will go. As long as I can rattle the devil's cage by doing it. As long as it shakes the kingdom of darkness every time you go on a trip. I say hallelujah. I'll drag right along. And I'll be hobbling right on in there, devil. Just watch out because I'm coming through again. So you're going to have to have some people that are going to lay aside their feelings and what they want, what they'd rather do. See, I'd put aside my druthers. Did you say I'd rather do this and I'd rather do that? I'd rather do this and the other? That's an old southern expression, in case you don't spell D-R-U-T-H-E-R, druther. I'd druther do this. Um, you won't find it in the dictionary. That's why I spelled it out for you. But uh, you've got to lay aside your druthers, what you'd rather do, and do what God says. And you know, it's a funny thing. Once you begin to do that, you get to where you're actually enjoying doing what God likes, even better than you like what you were doing. I don't think that Jesus always absolutely enjoyed every 
little minute of everything he did, but he did everything the Father told him to do, didn't he? If this life were filled with nothing but rose petals and spraying cologne, we would never want to leave it, you know. We'd just cry and carry on if we had to leave. We'd want to stay here forever, wouldn't we? But it's got enough bumps and briars in it till we say, well, anytime you're ready, I'm ready, Lord. All right? So he says, you don't know what manner of spirit you are of, for the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them, and they went on to another village. And that's what you're going to have to do when you're witnessing, when you're telling people about deliverance. Don't get upset when they won't receive you. Just walk off, say, just smile, say, okay. Let them stay in their ignorance. It's not going to do any good for you to get all upset about it. It's not necessarily because you didn't present it right, although you may have not done it right. It's not even necessarily a matter of timing, even though that might be, your timing might be off. But just go through the doors that God gives you and don't worry about the others. Our job is to share with those who want to hear and those who want to listen. Those who don't, let them go. Let them go. And you'll save yourself a lot of grief and a lot of heartache and a lot of disappointment. Because if you try to persuade them, I've been in deliverance meetings when somebody, uh, some mother drugged some big old boy up to me, set him down in the deliverance chair and he sat there. And uh, I said, uh, what do you need, son? <laughs> Ask her, you know. I said, uh, who are you? I'm his mother. He needs deliverance. Well, I could tell both of them did. <laughs> but she was determined for him to have deliverance, and he was mad as a hornet. And he had to come down there because she made him come. I don't know how she threatened him into it, but she got him down there. And he was no more going to get any deliverance, and he's going to fly to heaven on a goose. <laughs> no way. Are you going to coerce somebody into getting deliverance? I've seen women twist their husbands up and they march him up and set him down. Say, he needs deliverance. <laughs> and then they give him that look that says, if you don't get deliverance, I'm going to hit you. <laughs> and he looks back and says, just see if you can get me delivered. <laughs> well, I don't even fool with that kind. I'll just tell him, you know, if he didn't come down here because he wanted to, there's no way anybody can get him delivered. I said, son, if you want to have your demons drive you nuts and make you act an absolute idiot, make you a north end of a horse going south, I said, there's nobody can stop you. I said, you can be the biggest fool in the country and end up in hellfire if that's what you desire. Is that what you want? No. I said, well, you get out from here, and when you get back, you really want to be different. The way you are, you come back. Mama, you quit forcing him. There's no way you can make him do better. You just can't make people do things. You, you can lead them, but you can't push them. And when you get to being pushed, the devil is doing the pushing. I don't care how he disguises it. By the way, if you get in a meeting somewhere and they start pushing for money, that's not coming from the Lord. Amen? Mark it down. When you feel somebody pushing you, that's not the Lord. The Lord leads. He does not push. And oh, the millions of dollars have been wrung out of reluctant people. Well, don't be reluctant. Just don't do it. Then you have to be reluctant. Be happy. I didn't give a dime. <laughs> he tried to make me and I didn't do it. I told somebody one time in the church I had, I heard he was griping and belly aching because he'd put a, put some money in and I told him, I went to him, I said, look, if you're going to gripe, I said, I'll give you a dollar back. How's that? I said, I wouldn't want you to go off and give and gripe this church. You end up griping and belly aching around because you gave some money to the church. You end up with an ulcer and they'll call me and say, come see Brother So-and-So, he's in the hospital with an ulcer. So I said, well, he needs one. Anybody that greedy and selfish, let him eat it up. He caused it himself. It's better to let people do what they're supposed to do because they want to. You see, God's people are supposed to be educated 
in the scriptures so they will want to do the right thing so they will follow the Lord so they will do the right thing they're not supposed to be coerced and manipulated and forced into doing things and the church is as bad as the world in trying to coerce people to make them do the right thing or what the church perceives to be the right thing I don't see it that way you educate the people in the Bible and then let the Lord lead them And it came to pass, as they went that way, a certain man came to them and said, Lord, I'll follow thee whithersoever thou goest. Well, here, this is a refreshing change. Here comes somebody around and said, I want to follow you, Lord. I want to be a follower. Praise God, I'm joining up. I, I've got so excited about the miracles and the deliverance and the healings, and I just want to be a follower. And Jesus didn't, uh, he's not manipulating him, is he? Look at him. Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has not where to lay his head. A strange statement. That's no way to win followers. He should have said, I'm building a big uh, apartment complex over here for my followers, big office building to handle the publicity, and you can come and live in one of the apartments, and we'll set you up as one of the assistants and uh, we'll get you of course we'll give you transportation a special first class donkey and all of these things will come along to those who are following along no no when I read this I, I thought again about the Indonesians saying that when the offering they started taking the offering in Indonesia Derek Prince said now don't tip the Lord And how he said Jesus was a very rich man. And I thought, well, he sure didn't. He didn't talk about it much. He was. Foxes have holes. Birds have nests. The Son of Man has not where to lay his head. He said, I don't even have a place that's my own, a house of my own. And another one came to him, and, and uh, he, he came up to him. And he said, follow me. He said, well, Lord, allow me first to go and bury my father. Well, now that doesn't sound too bad. Let me go to my daddy's funeral, and then I'll be glad. We've got to bury dad, and then, then I'll be alone to follow you. Jesus said, let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And somebody said, my word, you mean he couldn't take out to go to his daddy's funeral? You don't understand what he meant. He meant, let me go home and stay home until daddy dies. And when I bury him, then I'll come and follow you. Oh, yeah, his daddy wasn't dead. His daddy was alive and well. He said, let me go stay home with dad until he dies. As soon as he dies, then I'll be free to go. Then I can come and follow you. And Jesus said, let the dead bury their dead. You can go and preach the kingdom of God. Another said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go and bid them farewell, which are at home in my house. Jesus said a strange thing. No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Well, why didn't he want to go home and tell everybody at home goodbye? Because he knew what happened. That young man would go back there. Mom would pitch a fit. Oh, you mean you're just going out without anything? Oh. And daddy would say, is this what we raised you for? His aunts and uncles, his grandparents, they go into orbit over this. Oh, well, where are you going? I don't know. I'm just following him. Well, where are you going to be staying? I don't know. He doesn't have a house. Uh, where's your dress? I don't know. You know what they do? They pull him back and make him do the sensible thing and stay home. So he said, don't even go home to say goodbye because they'll pull you back. Put your hand to the plow and you turn back and said, you're not fit for the kingdom of God. He didn't say you wouldn't be in it. He just said, you're not fit for it. I've seen a lot of those that put their hand in the plow and turn back. I remember when I was a young preacher in college, I had a preacher come out to my church to preach. He was a very good preacher. He was pastoring a church. and So he was a young married student. He came out, and we had a couple of real good meetings. The first two nights were very good. People were coming good. The church was getting a blessing. And that night when we got back to the hotel, his wife called and she was crying because she was lonesome 
He'd been gone two whole nights. Bless her little pointed head. And uh, <laughs> see, she was lonesome and and, and uh, why couldn't he come home with Eli? He spent about 30 minutes on the phone. And did you know that he packed up and went home and left that meeting? I had to finish the meeting. I thought to myself, buddy, you're through. You, that little lady of yours has got lots to learn. If she thinks she's got to stay with you constantly, she's got another thought coming. And he really shocked me because I thought he had more sense than that. But he, his name was Mr. Doorknob and his wife turned it anytime she wanted to. <laughs> and let me tell you something. Anytime a fella can be controlled by his wife, then that fella is not doing his wife right. Because he will open her to the full fury of satanic attack. The devil will never fight with the strong man in the house who's the husband, who's stronger and better equipped to stand against the enemy. As long as all he has to do is get mama upset and mama will make daddy do whatever uh, the devil wants done. And gals, don't you be a tool in the devil's hand because God will blister you and wreck you and spank you and and your kids will be monsters, and you just can't imagine all the horrible things that are going to happen to you if you interfere with your husband being the head of the house. Brother Joe's going to preach on destruction of family priesthood in the, in the workshop. Did you get that down, Brother Joe? Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's not love to relinquish control of things and direction and not do what you know is right because absolutely the devil will never fool with you he'll attack mama all the time because all he has to do is get her upset then he, she'll get a hold of you and you'll do what she says now let that soak in for a minute there goes that woman hating preacher again I'll declare no women have a special place but it's just not in leadership and any time they get in leadership, it's a mess. Check the churches out that are being led by women. Check them out. Check the families that are being directed by the ladies. Gal, move back into praying for that turkey. You say, well, he is no good. Well, you picked him. I didn't. I certainly, if you'd asked me, I told you, forget it. But anyhow, you got him. Now then, you got to pray him through. You say, well, that's too hard. Well, see, the Lord knew you liked hard jobs, and so he gave you one. The hardest one of all. But that's the way you have to do it. And God is moving in these days to straighten out some of these things. And one of the things he wants to do is get people to put their hand to the plow and not turn around. And not be turned by the tears and fears of the home front. And gals, you're just going to have to, when, when God puts his hand on your man to do something for him, you're just going to have to bite your lip and hang in there and pray God will give you grace to go through with him. Otherwise, he's going to go on through and you'll be left back in the dust with a hearty high old silver away. You'll be asking Tonto where he is. So you better, if I were you, I'd just hang in there and pray for him. And if you want God to bless you and bless your family, you help your husband to be free to do what God tells him to do. That doesn't mean he's going to preach. That doesn't mean he's going to be a missionary. But whatever God wants him to do, you can be a help that way. And you can be a real strength to him and a help if he knows you're backing him. Because you, you influence him a great deal. And... Uh, he doesn't need to fight a two-front war. He's going to have to fight it out in the business world. Don't you bring a war home for him to fight when he gets home. You ask the Lord to show you how to do it. He can do it. You say, well, our situation is different. It'll be more different than that if you don't follow God's precepts. But God does intend to help people go. And there are people in this church that are going to be greatly used to the Lord if 
they stay on the trail. If they stay. And there are men here who are going to be used to really turn multitudes. And the work of this church is right in the embryo stage right now. It's, it's only just beginning. And some of you are going to be used to do far more than I've ever done. Providing you're willing to pay the price. And you little wives are going to have to pay the price right along with you. You're going to have to sit down and figure out, is it worth it in heaven or what it's going to cost here? And don't be a fool and sell out for a hand of trinkets down here. Because these you're not taking with you. You're going to send ahead the treasure that lasts. And when the treasure that lasts comes from being dedicated to the Lord and being yoked fellows together, and every time you help your husband succeed spiritually, every time you help him preach, sing, or minister, or whatever he does, if you're backing him and praying, you get an even, you get a slice of whatever reward he gets. And why should you have to go out there and try to do it yourself? It's a lot easier to back him up. And on the other hand, every time you buck and pitch and snort and act ugly and make it hard for him to do what God says, you lose, and you get absolutely nothing. And whatever reward comes to him, you'll miss. And that'll be an eternal miss. That won't be a... You see, when you're dealing with God, you're dealing with eternal reward or eternal loss. And what you get, you keep for eternity. So I'd urge you to just reevaluate yourself and keep, keep close tabs on yourself. Keep short counts with God and ask God to show you how. Get in the Bible, find out what God wants you to do, and then help do it, and then help your husband to do it as well. You're vital to the kingdom of God, vital to the ongoing of the kingdom of God. And uh, I don't know how we got way over there, but we did. Well, some of you are looking pretty solemn, so I guess it did some good anyway. Now, if you've never asked Jesus in your heart, or you're not sure that you have, would you like to do it tonight? He said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. If you've never asked him in your heart and you're not sure, you could do it tonight. If you can't make sure where you are, come down to the front. Don't hesitate. Just come down and tell one of the fellows down in the front, I need to talk to somebody about salvation. They'll sign your worker who will do just exactly that. That's not your problem, but you're driven, harassed, tormented. This is producing compulsive behavior, which slows down, stops, and reverses spiritual growth and progress. What you need is deliverance. Jesus said, These signs shall follow them that believe, and my name shall they cast out devils, speak with new tongues, lay hands on the sick. They shall recover. This church moves into a body ministry at this point, and the whole body will be involved in helping you get free. If you need freedom from evil spirits, they're equipped to do that. If you need the baptism in the Holy Spirit, that's available. If you need healing from uh, sickness or physical problems, that's available. Everything the family has to offer is spread tonight for whatever you have a need for. We're going to stand and sing something about that name as we do. If you have a need, by all means come and let God minister to you through his people. <clears throat> Jesus, Jesus.